Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 59 of Compliance Into the Weeds, a podcast with myself and Matt Kelly, where we take a deep dive into a compliance or compliance-related topic, literally going into the weeds to fully explore an issue. Today we take up an interesting question posed by Matt, which is with the news from Rod Rosenstein that there will be a comprehensive Department of Justice review of various memos since at least the Holder memo from the uh, late part of the 1990s going forward, whether or not the Department of Justice's evaluation of corporate compliance programs document will be discarded, folded into the uh, reclarification and restating, uh, and incorporated directly into the U.S. Attorney's Manual, or what might be the fate of this document. We take a deep dive into why we both believe the document is so important and that the concepts set forth in the evaluation of corporate compliance programs are questions that the Department of Justice and compliance practitioners need to utilize for their own compliance programs. It's a fascinating discussion of internal DOJ policy, where it might go, and the importance of communications from the Department of Justice, particularly around their expectations of best practices compliance programs. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. Tom Fox, back again with my good friend and colleague, Matt Kelly, founder and editor of Radical Compliance for another uh, episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. Matt, welcome. Hello, Tom. Good to be back, as always. So, Matt, you have uh, actually suggested a very interesting topic that I think is really apropos, uh, and that is, uh, generally speaking, with the announcement from Rod Rosenstein about the um, review that's going on in the Department of Justice and the various memos, the Yates memo, Holder memo, Thompson memo, uh, McNulty memo, and everything in between, uh, and uh, in conjunction with the updated U.S. Attorney's Manual, what might, if anything, become of the Department of Justice's evaluation of corporate compliance programs document, which was released in February? And so it seemed like to me a great topic to go into the weeds on. So uh, what are your initial thoughts? Well, you know, it, I, I think that this guidance, and I know that the author, Hui Chen, who I respect immensely, I know she'll wince a little bit when we call it guidance, but it's just my, my practice, I haven't been able to train myself to call it another word. But this evaluation guidance really is going to be here to stay. And my whole point in thinking about it was that uh, I was working on a presentation with another compliance professional not long ago where we made mention of this guidance, and it only came out in February. And so my co-presenter said, should we really be mentioning this? Is it possible that when Rod Rosenstein, the deputy AG, when he comes out with a new policy pronouncement sometime, could this evaluation guidance, could it disappear? And are we all kind of running around talking about it for just a temporary thing and it's fleeting and then eventually it will go away? So that's why it was on my mind. But I actually would say that two things. Could the document itself be somehow superseded? Sure. You know what? In this administration, which has a penchant for deciding that everything prior to January 20th was awful, everything from 20th forward is going to be awesome and massive and spectacular and whatnot, could this administration do some sort of Orwellian erasure of facts and we lose sight of this guidance document? It's not on the site anymore and people never speak of it again and all this. Yeah, that could happen on a tangible basis. However, on a substantive basis, what this evaluation guidance, what this document, whatever we want to call it, you know, but on the substance of it, what it's asking compliance officers to do, what it was pushing compliance officers to be able to show, that's great stuff. And I honestly do not believe that whatever Rod Rosenstein might come up with in the future, if it is very sweeping, I don't think it's going to run counter to what this guidance is talking about. Um, so I, like I say in the, the post I have about this that's going up on my blog this week, you know, I think even if the document vanishes from the uh, Justice Department website, you know, you can pretty much print it out right now and frame it on your wall because where it's going, where it's how it's making you think, that stuff is here for a long, long time. 
So I think we get to the same place, but we may take a, uh, I may take a more circuitous path. Uh, sure. Matt. So uh, when I heard Rosenstein's comments, uh, I took that to mean that he was going to take a look at the Holder memo, the Thompson memo, the McNulty memo, the Yates memo uh, in a much broad, much broader brush review in connection with the Philip factors in connection with the U S attorney's manual and uh, try to put together uh, something um, uh, more coherent, but it may just be another clarification. And and I really hadn't focused on uh, the evaluation because it doesn't really rise to the level. It hadn't gone through the vetting process uh, as Mm -hmm. what Jenny has explained to us in your podcast uh, to have something like the Yates memo released. Uh, so uh, I really hadn't thought of the evaluation as being part of that overall process. Uh, that led me to, uh, leads me to, to all, but agree 110% with your uh, conclusion that this is incredibly valuable information, whether it's Wei Chen asking more questions, whether it's Matt Kelly asking the questions, Tom Fox, or someone just a compliance officer sitting in their office thinking of questions to benchmark their own program on their own. Uh, it's a, also a compendium of recent uh, FCPA enforcement actions, and I would point you to in training where they memorialize the term tailored training, which uh, the first time we saw that in enforcement action was General Cable. Now, now we know that this document was written as early as, or at least a draft, as early as December 2015, was started used by the uh, DOJ in January 2016, so perhaps not surprising to see that. But now we have uh, the Department of Justice's thinking memorialized in a way that we see memorialized in enforcement actions. And those enforcement actions are not going away. The best practices in those enforcement actions become cutting-edge best practices, which then move to the middle of the road. But uh, uh, the part that I really come down on is this is just an excellent document for getting compliance officers to think. And Wei Chen was absolutely correct when she said that on your podcast. It's gotten us all to think. We've written about it, talked about it. We've had sessions about it at conferences. We podcasted about it. And we will continue to do so uh, because it is significant, substantive, and excellent information, uh, even if you leave aside the issue of this was the way the DOJ was thinking about it after an enforcement action, because you and I, our clients are not typically in enforcement actions. They're asking us for advice on an ongoing basis. So for mm-hmm. all of those reasons, I think it's just an excellent document that every compliance officer should uh, have as part of their portfolio now. Yeah. you know, I mean, when you think about what Rod Rosenstein is doing lately, and he's giving a lot of speeches trying to defend the Trump administration, saying, yes, it really does respect the rule of law. I believe that Rod Rosenstein might, and most of the Justice Department might, I think from his level higher, all the way to the Oval Office, I am more skeptical about that they do understand what the rule of law is. But Rosenstein himself, like his longtime prosecutor, his heart is in the right place. If he wants to do some sort of big sweep up of documentation out there, and there's a lot of it out there, wants to boil it all into an updated U.S. attorney's manual or boil it into a Rosenstein memo. I'd put my money on the U.S. attorney's memo, manual, not on the Rosenstein memo. But if he wants to do that, like, hey, dude, fine. That, that makes sense. There's a lot of documentation. Keeping it simple is great. You want to say that this is to defend the rule of law, you know, whatever makes yourself sleep at night if you're working for this administration, that's fine too. But the guidance that Hui Chen published, the effectiveness questions there. Really, my point is that you, the compliance officer, it is about your ability to answer questions like that. Now, when a federal prosecutor has that those questions in front of him or her, he will be asking about a specific set of facts and putting them to you, and that's going to be pointed and awkward. However, for the vast majority of people, who are not yet under investigation, who are just trying to build a good compliance function, you can look at these questions without any specific fact pattern and be thinking, how do I build a program that has the ability to answer questions like this, regardless of what the fact pattern might be? Because I'm never going to know that up until we have an incident. Like That's the correct way to think about these questions and how to drive that evaluation. Um, I remember I was always struck by 
one point when Hui Chen and I were talking where I mentioned I counted out all these questions and she says, you know, we never counted the questions. We might not even necessarily ask large numbers of these questions. If you have a specific problem in a area that corresponds to one piece of the effectiveness guidance, we're going to ask those kind of questions. We're going to forget about all the rest, um, which makes sense from a prosecutor's view. But for a compliance officer, you look at the totality of it. And really, it's just about how do I have an ability to answer any question along these lines that might come along? Um, and all of this, like, it's not going to go away, regardless of what Rod Rosenstein says. My view has always been a radical shift in Justice Department approach to compliance would be taking the opposite of what we've done for so long. So if Rod Rosenstein stands up and makes a speech where he discourages voluntary cooperation, where he says you should not it help find a guilty individual, where you should not bother to clean up the uh, problems and do a root cause analysis, don't bother with any of that. That's what a reversal of the Yates memo would look like. And that's preposterous. He is never going to stand up and say, you should be evasive and not cooperate and lie and cover up the problems and all this. That's not going to happen. So whatever they might tell themselves to make it sound like they've repudiated past administration policy, politically, that's what they want to do. Substantively, they want to stick with what we have been doing for eight or nine years. They want to keep on saying you have to investigate, you have to cooperate, you have to disclose and show a willingness. And so all of this, I think, is, you know, it might come, be boiled into a different form, but none of it on the substance, none of it is going away. So once again, let me see if I can take it from a little bit different perspective. But once again, I'm going to, I mm-hmm. think, come out where where you are, Matt, which is one of the the things I got out of Jesse Eisinger's book, The Chicken Shit Club, was the memos released, and I, I, I named them the, some of them, a Holder Memo, the Thompson Memo, the McNulty Memo, the Yates memo, uh, in many ways, those memos were slight changes in Department of Justice focus based upon uh, commentary, feedback, pushback uh, from the private sector, whether that be the Chamber of Commerce, whether it be commentators like the SCCE, people like you and I, Defense Counsel. Um, so the Department of Justice uh, listens to uh, the people that are on the other side of the table and, and its critics and, and those who uh, champion it as well. And so we've seen the department uh, make changes, make modifications, make clarifications uh, in each memo and, and perhaps uh, kind of synthesizing them down into one new memo, the Rosenstein memo, uh, would not be an inappropriate exercise. But to your point uh, that uh, Rod Rosenstein is not – at the Department of Justice, nor is Jeff Sessions, to say, we're not going to prosecute people. Uh, we got all these laws, and if you break them and don't tell us, good for you. You're absolutely right. That that will never happen. People don't take those jobs not to prosecute. And the basis of the Yates memo, whether it was followed or not, was that we are going to now prosecute more aggressively individuals. And I understand that part is open to interpretation. But Rod Rosenstein, nor Jeff Sessions, is ever going to say, Individuals who break the law will be prosecuted less by this Justice Department. They may change their focus on policies, but they will never say that. Uh, The other thing that we really hadn't thrown into this mix is the pilot program, uh, because I Mm -hmm. can see that being a part of a review and that uh, the concepts laid out in the pilot program, uh, self-disclosure, extensive cooperation, extensive remediation, and profit disgorgement becoming a part of the – Attorneys, uh, U.S. Attorney's Manual as guidance for U.S. attorneys going forward in how to consider um, the potential fine penalty or, or resolution with a corporation. So uh, I can certainly see a consolidation, and I would just see it really as a clarification or putting together in one uh, or uh, nefariously, uh, conspiratorially uh, taking the name of the Yates memo off the Yates memo so that Sally Yates' name does not appear on a document that says we're going to prosecute individuals who violate the law. Rod Rosenstein says that. Uh, That could certainly be an equally important part of this administration as well. You know, another fine point for compliance professionals to think about, and it can get a little bit blurry, so we have to unpack it, is There's a difference between 
legal departments worried about prosecution and how they defend themselves and what this guidance says to them and their experience and compliance officers who might get into an incident that is under investigation. That's not uncommon, but really your day job is first and foremost to build a good ethics and compliance function. So you never get to the legal department phase where you are under investigation. Now we we all know how the world really works, but um, if you look at this solely as how can these documents inform what my compliance program should strive to do to build better conduct, then, you know, suddenly a whole lot of it you see is really just immemorial wisdom that's going to be around yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, Self-disclosure is always going to be the morally right thing to do. And if we take seriously that we're trying to be an ethical and moral company, then that's what's going to stick around. Now, defense lawyers are more interested in what is that which I do to minimize my litigation exposure? And perhaps I should not disclose. They're not wrong to be thinking about that because they're corporate defense lawyers and that's their job. However, ethics and compliance officers have a larger purview they need to think about. And for a lot of this documentation and what's going to happen to all this guidance and what form will it be in by 2018 and whose memos on what names and all this stuff, like you can put all of that aside. You are more interested in what does the substance of this say about how I can build strong function. And the the effectiveness guidance can say an awful lot about that. So that's why I think that, as I say in my post, you know, you can print it out and have it framed on your wall because the wisdom therein is not going to go away. So Matt, I know we have a hard stop coming up, but uh, one other point I wanted to raise is the following that beginning in the fall of 2015, around the time that Wei Chen was retained as the compliance counsel for the Department of Justice, um, Leslie Caldwell uh, began a series of speeches by Department of Justice representatives, including herself, including Sally Yates, including Wei Chen, including Andrew Wiseman, which articulated many of the concepts that we see in the evaluation. And if you put all of those speeches together, Bill Baer uh, as well spoke to the SCCE. Uh, if you put all those together, they are largely what we see in the evaluation. So now it's clear to me where those concepts were coming from, in large part, if not the evaluation discussions internal within the Department of Justice. Having the evaluation puts all of those concepts in one document, whether it is something that the department formally accepts uh, as part of the uh, U.S. Attorney's Manual going forward, whether it's just out there on the website or whether it's taken down, it really doesn't matter because it's in the public record. And uh, this administration is not going to disavow, uh, as uh, the IMF force might have been once upon a time, uh, the prior uh, commentary by Department of Justice on what to do uh, when you violate the law, uh, at least in the FCPA realm, in terms of self-disclosure, cooperation, remediation, and disgorgement going forward. Yeah, I agree. So, Matt, this is uh, I love this uh, going into the weeds with you. It's a ton of fun. So we've been talking about the future of the evaluation of corporate compliance documents. Uh, I hope we have convinced you that it should be uh, uh, in your repertoire of things to uh, refer to, think about, and utilize in your compliance program going forward. So, Matt, with that, uh, thank you, and I uh, look forward to uh, your post going up this week. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast as it would help in our rankings and help get the word out about the only weekly podcast in compliance, which literally goes into the weeds for a deep dive into a particular topic or subject. Also, if you have any questions, you can contact myself at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. You can email Matt at mkelly at radicalcompliance.com. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope you'll join us again next week when Matt and I take another look at Compliance Into the Weeds. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Thank you.